Hi, this is chapter 17, an excerpt uh, from my book. And um, this is a historical review uh, of grief counseling and grief counseling theories. I usually don't include this in the very first week of class, but I wanted to make your readings more manageable and spread them throughout the five weeks. So I'm going to talk about the first part of this chapter today uh, for the first week, and then I'm going to talk about another part of this chapter later in the course because um, the first part is talking about the historical aspects of grief counseling, and that's what we'll cover. And then the second part of the chapter begins to apply my theory of death anxiety and regret therapy to grief counseling. We're going to talk about that part later in the course. But if you read it now, um, the rest of the semester, uh, the reading should be a little more manageable and divided equally. Um, so this was written uh, by me and a couple colleagues, Mark Lepore and Rick Meyer. And let's just um, begin with a couple quotations. This first one is by William Wadsworth, Wordsworth, and uh, the second one is by Confucius, but William Wordsworth. It's a poem. Be not forever taken from my sight, though nothing can bring back the hour of splendor in the grass, of glory in the flower. Grief not rather find strength in what remains behind. The primal sympathy, which having been, must ever be, in the soothing thoughts that spring out of human suffering, and the faith that looks through death, and years that bring philophic mind. And then Confucius wrote, While you are not able to serve men, or humans, how can you serve spirits of the dead? While you do not know life, how can you know about death? So what this is really saying is in order to know how to live, we need to know how to die. In order to know how to die or to grieve the loss of others, that helps us to understand how to live. That reflection may seem like a paradox, but kind of connects back to what I was originally saying about death and loss and grief adding meaning to life in the present, helping us to appreciate the present and to live more fully and to understand that relationships truly don't end, that relationships continue because those relationships become part of who we are as individuals. So let's look at the beginning. One of the things that's really important to understand is that grief is a universal experience. Everybody experiences this. However, when we undergo or suffer during the grieving process, we often feel alone, resulting from that loss of other. And so that's one reason why grief and loss groups are often very helpful, because when we're in a counseling group, it speaks to the universality of the experience, that we, in some sense, are alone, but we are experiencing grief and loss as part of the human condition. And we can share that experience with others who are also experiencing grief and loss. I'm going to highlight some of the uh, main points of this chapter, and you can read it in its entirety. And if you'd like to go into more detail, um, you can discuss it more fully 
in our discussion posts. Okay, so one of the things I provide is a longer definition. Uh, so we believe a def definition for the grief experience is needed and I look to a number of different authors here. Um, in general, this group of theorists uh, defines grief as people's response to a loss, including psychological, behavioral, social, spiritual, uh, whatever your spiritual belief system might be, and even uh, being an agnostic or an atheist is a belief system, um, and that's okay and physical experiences. And we talked a little bit uh, from Warden's notes about the differences between grief and bereavement and mourning. And this goes into a little more detail. Um, one of the important things uh, that I think we should note is that grief is not linear in nature. Um, even though some of the theories that we're going to look at have stages of grief, um, it's not as if we complete one stage and move on. Um, we can often cycle back. It, it may be cyclical. We may ex re-experience uh, different stages of the grieving process. Um, it includes people's reactions and adaptations to a loss. Um, perceived as something that cannot be regained. Rando, one of our primary theorists, points out that there's two categories for loss, physical and psychosocial or symbolic. Physical loss is the loss of something tangible, uh, such as when a house is destroyed by fire. A psychosocial loss is less tangible, such as when an individual experiences a divorce or a lost dream. And Warden primarily looks at the loss of an individual through death. We can look at the historical perspective of grief and loss counseling. There's been a lot of different uh, approaches um, and ATIG uh, categorizes them into three types. Stage or phase models, we can see that here. Medical models and task models. And uh, this can be useful in understanding the various types of theories. So let's first look at stage or phase models. And Sigmund Freud uh, suffered from grief, loss, death, anxiety. He wrote Mourning and Melancholia, which I mentioned earlier. It's a very elemental, uh, elementary model for the understanding of grief. Um, he believed the ego and the id are involved in this process, and when faced with a loss, uh, we begin to disengage identification with that lost object or human. And when I say object, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but it's just an all-encompassing term. And he believed that we begin to withdraw energy, and I think this was one of the original theories, and it's a good thing that he began to think about the grieving process, but I also think that um, it is an older theory and we have some uh, more pertinent theories uh, that, came, that came later. Um, talks about two levels uh, and they have to do with attachment, the lost interpersonal relationship and the interpersonal meaning of the loss, how it affects us. Uh, or even narcissism. These two events take place simultaneously as individuals let go. That previous attachment begins searching for new attachments. So Freud's really talking about finding new attachments to replace the old attachments. And I like the newer theories because I don't believe we can replace old attachments. I believe that our relationship continues and um, and we don't need to replace old attachments. We carry them with us, but they create new meaning 
in our lives. Eric Lindemann, we mentioned him. He was one of the early theorists. He first looked at the Coconut Grove nightclub fire in 1942. Um, and we talked a little bit about him in our warden notes. And uh, he uses a task model, um, which is which is pretty interesting. He, uh, and these tasks include letting go of psychological attachments, very similar to Freud, uh, with the deceased, assimilating to a new environment without the deceased, and building new relationships. And uh, once again, I think it was uh, positive that these early theorists began looking at grief and loss and identifying a lot of the different things, but I do think that we have some more advanced theories now. And Bowlby, we also talked about in our early notes um, from Warden, and we went over the different uncomplicated phases. Uh, we talked about some of the different experiences. He took these also in uh, stages or phases, first being a numbing, and then a yearning or a searching, and disorganization and an experience of despair, and then reorganization in our lives without the un other individual. He included a unique cognitive component in his model, suggesting that cognitive biases influence uh, personal perceptions and belief systems. And he really looked at individuals' experiences of attachment. Remember, Bowlby was one of the primary originators of uh, original theorists of attachment theory. He believed that we had to move through these stages, and their ultimate resolution involves individuals searching for the lost object, recognizing the permanence of the loss, understanding that, yes, this loss is permanent, Finally, reorganizing the perception of the lost object along with forming relationships with new objects. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, most people identify her as a grief and loss theorist, but in reality, um, she talked about death and dying and an individual's experience of losing one's own life, death anxiety, losing oneself going through and experiencing a terminal illness as opposed to the loss of other. However, we can apply her theories of uh, experiencing terminal illness and dealing with our own death to grief and loss of other. And she has a very popular stage theory. Uh, most people refer to this. Uh, denial and isolation is the first stage. Anger, which is, I believe, a secondary emotion resulting for an underlying, from an underlying emotion. Bargaining, depression, and then ultimately acceptance. She believes that individuals progress through these stages at their own speed, some having more difficulty in specific stages than others. Um, I believe that some of these are valid uh, as well, but we do have uh, more advanced stages as well. And, and she did believe that hers uh, were not precisely linear. So we're going to end these early models, these early stage models, and then in part two of chapter 17 lecture, we're going to go over medical models and task models.